Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge the presence of the Deputy Director of the Woodrow Wilson Center and a gentleman whose uh, participation and input was very important in securing the federal grant that made this conference possible, Michael Van Dusen. So, Michael, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And I will ask all of you, to the extent that your schedules permit, please return to the auditorium when this luncheon program is concluded. Uh, the third panel will be outstanding. Uh, we will look at the road ahead, Islam and Europe in the 21st century. Uh, it will be moderated by my colleague, uh, the Associate Director of the Wilson Center and the Director of the West Europe Studies Program, Dr. Samuel Wells. And it will include uh, Daniel Pipes, the Director of the Middle East Forum, Dr. Sarah Silvestri of the University of Cambridge, and Dr. Kemal Saleh, who chairs the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Program at, at uh, Indiana University. Uh, and I think it will be uh, the, the critical closing of this first part of our analytical efforts uh, to better explore and understand the dynamics of effective integration of European Islam. It's a pleasure indeed to introduce the keynote speaker uh, for the luncheon part of the program as a counterpoint to our morning keynote speaker, uh, Ambassador Zbogar of Slovenia. We thank you again, Mr. Ambassador, for joining us today and for being with us for the luncheon. The Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, Scott Carpenter, uh, is here at a very critical juncture in his own professional schedule because after he finishes his remarks here today, he's off to the airport and flying to Yemen, where he will head the U.S. official delegation uh, at the uh, convening of the Foundation for the Future, which is a non-governmental, did I have that correctly? State Department colleagues, is that correct? Foundation for the Future? as part of the, uh, the BEMINA initiative, the broader Middle East and Northern Africa initiative uh, launched by the administration. And uh, he will be there uh, heading the U.S. delegation along with about 400 organizations uh, from around the world uh, being brought together by this U.S., G8, and other European initiative. And to give you the sense of importance that this administration and the U.S. government is placing on this la larger broader Middle East and Northern Africa initiative, um, the head of the U.S. Uh, sort of official representation for this foundation for the future is the recently retired Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. And so uh, we will wish uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Carpenter a safe trip and a very productive visit to Yemen. I don't know if all of you here have his biography, so I'll be very brief, and I want to just focus on some of the highlights here to give you a sense of the, the caliber of speaker that we have uh, for today's keynote address. Uh, J. Scott Carpenter uh, joined the Near East Affairs Bureau in August of 2004 and is responsible for overseeing the Middle East Partnership Initiative. Uh, appointed uh, by Administrator Paul Bremer's Director of the Governance Group for the Coalition Provisional Authority in Iraq, as we all know, he began his tour of duty in Iraq in May of 2003, and in that capacity, the Deputy Assistant Secretary helped to guide the political transition and to initiate a wide array of democracy initiatives during the whole of the Coalition Provisional Authority's existence. From May of 2003 to July 2004, he served as a key advisor to the administrator, facilitating the formation of the Iraqi Governing Council, the formation of the first post-Saddam cabinet, the drafting and signing of the transitional administrative law, which, is, which was Iraq's interim constitution, and the establishment of Iraq's interim government. Uh, in effect, he has presided over the design and implementation of the largest single democratization effort in one country since the fall of the Berlin Wall. His biography is illustrious in its succeeding paragraphs, but I think it's more important for us to be able to hear what uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary brings to the Woodrow Wilson Center today. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome him here to the Wilson Center to address an issue of, I think, pivotal importance here for the United States, uh, in Europe, and uh, amongst our Muslim colleagues uh, throughout the world. Uh, without any further ado, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, Scott Carpenter. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, uh, Michael. Thank you uh, for the, the invitation. 
I really appreciate the opportunity to come uh, be here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. It's always a, a great pleasure. Um, keynote address. Uh, it's always a bit, you know, dr sounds a bit dramatic. I'm really hoping that we'll be able to have a uh, conversation um, about our perspective on the issue of uh, integration of uh, Muslims into our society and also into European society and what, it, what elements and dynamics uh, we're confronting as we try to advance a foreign policy in the Arab world that looks to address some of these issues as well. Um, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to be here this morning. I saw the, the panels uh, that were assembled. They seem to be uh, extremely uh, good panels. I've understood that the discussion was um, animated, and uh, I think the intellectual energy that I heard uh, discussed before I uh, came into the lunchroom is something that I really regret missing. I regret in particular not hearing the other keynote uh, address that shared with us the uh, European uh, perspective on Muslim integration. Um, I guess I want to say, first of all, just a couple of anecdotes. It's true. I am heading out to uh, Sana'a later this afternoon. Uh, there, there are non-governmental organizations from across the Arab world, from Europe, uh, from the United States, uh, coming together with governments from the G8, from all of the uh, governments of the Arab world, together with governments of the G8, plus, plus um, other countries like Spain, uh, uh, the Netherlands, um, other countries that have uh, a stake uh, in the future of the Arab world, to talk about real issues of political uh, importance in the region. How are these countries going to uh, create the necessary political openness, um, the economic engine that will be able to uh, keep these societies from uh, succumbing to the demographic pressure that's mounting uh, there. These are real and practical issues. And last week, uh, in, in, in part in preparation for my departure uh, for Sana'a, I went to Detroit. That seems a rather odd thing to do for a Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Department of State who's responsible for foreign policy in the Arab world to go to Detroit. Um, but the fact is that the largest kind of uh, largest uh, population of Arab Americans uh, in the U.S. is in Dearborn and Detroit area. And so, uh, in part, <clears throat> I wanted to go and uh, talk with them about uh, our uh, foreign policy in this particular area and to also solicit from them ideas and thoughts um, and also to encourage them to use the networks that they have back home to be able to explain what it is that we're trying to do and to work uh, with us on making our programs and our policy uh, more effective and efficient. Now, of course, uh, no matter where, where I, if I'm in, if I'm in, uh, if I'm in the region or if I'm in Detroit, you know, one of the issues that is always raised is the Palestinian-Israeli conflict as you know a source of great resentment and uh, simmering difficulty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what we all recognize is that that issue has been with us for a very long time and is not going to be solved overnight. It hasn't been solved to date. We need to continue to work it. But in the meantime, there are tremendous stresses that are being built up in the region um, uh, as a result of uh, governance issues that I think we also have to address. And so as Arab Americans, um, to engage and to get their perspective and to uh, uh, get their advice on how best to proceed forward um, has, a, I think, a dual uh, benefit. One is that it actually does help. But the other thing is it reminds uh, the Arab American community in the United States that the government is engaging and wants to have their perspective um, on, on some very, uh, very difficult, challenging um, issues. Um, the United States of America obviously is extremely different from uh, Europe. We're a young country. Um, we're built on the idea of immigration. Um, we have these myths 
mobilizing myths about ourselves in terms of our uh, being a melting pot, the idea of the American dream when anybody can come and succeed if they only uh, work hard, and the idea that anybody can be an American. Uh, and that's a mobilizing idea. It has tremendous force, uh, and that makes us a bit different, I think, uh, from the way in which uh, Europe evolved. Um, so the various cultures and traditions of peoples from Europe, Asia, Africa, the Americas, the Middle East, um, help to create this rich diversity. It doesn't mean that all is harmony, but that there is a, a rich diversity and the mobilizing myth and idea of the United States is something that everyone more or less shares. And the degree that they don't share that, that idea, the same problems that are confronted uh, in Europe and elsewhere about resentment, uh, being anti-system, and our history has been punctuated uh, with uh, periods of great violence. Um, one thinks of the great wave of Catholic immigration um, in the 19th century and how a predominantly Protestant culture um, had to uh, absorb that and the difficulties uh, that we had with that. But on the whole, we've been able to continue to um, uh, adjust and adapt the American idea to the, the latest immigration uh, coming to us. I think there's a lot that could be said, and I understand John did say a bit this morning, about the nature of um, our uh, more recent uh, immigrants, uh, the differences between, in terms of demographics, who, who's been coming. So I won't spend any time really talking about that. But why am I here? Why is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State standing here talking about these things? Well, it's because for us uh, and for the Bush administration, September 11th was a defining moment for the United States. Um, our uh, lives were, of course, changed forever. Uh, for better or worse, and the prism through which we viewed uh, you, America and also uh, uh, the, the world around us also changed radically. I mean, I just remember the shock of most people, including my parents and others, why would anybody do this to us, you know? And I remember hearing the same thing from the, the Danish foreign minister when he was watching his consul, his embassy burn in Beirut. Why would any, you know, the, we're, we're Denmark. You know, why would anybody do this to us? Well, um, we, we wanted to understand the reasons why anyone would do that to us, and there are multiple facets to that, of course. But the one that I deal with um, is the idea that the President expressed in 2003, which is essentially that we had to re-examine fundamentally our approach to many of the governments uh, in the, the, the region. Terror has many bases. Um, and, you know, as, as we know, um, uh, terrorists can be educated or non-educated. They can be rich. They can be poor. They can be motivated by one ideology or, or another. But the underlying um, kind of uh, difficulties in the Arab world uh, that arise from a, a uh, a form of government that is not responsive to its people clearly uh, contributes. Um, lack of uh, freedom does. And so uh, the president said, look, we, we need to uh, answer, in asking the question about what, what September 11 means, we had to recognize that a fundamental change in our policy toward the Arab world was in order. And the change was predicated on the idea that Western nations should no longer, Western nations, not just the United States, but Western nations should no longer excuse and accommodate a lack of freedom in the Middle East. President Bush said, 60 years of Western nations excusing and accommodating lack of freedom in the Middle East did nothing to make us safe. Because in the long run, stability cannot be purchased at the expense of liberty. As long as the Middle East remains a place where freedom doesn't flourish, it will remain a place of stagnation resentment and violence ready for export. And with the spread of weapons that can bring catastrophic harm to a country and to our friends, it would be reckless to accept the status quo. So a conservative Republican talking about it being reckless to um, accept the status quo.
The commitment to freedom and opportunity for people in the broader Middle East is perhaps the single most important policy change for the U.S. in decades. And it's a product of our belief that without freedom, the region will not be able to fully integrate itself into the global community. To us, this integration is key, is the key to stability and peace, as democratic institutions often offer perhaps the only hope for peaceful expressions of dissatisfaction and resolution of grievances otherwise expressed by terrorism and extremism or other revolutionary impulses. Since 2003, uh, one of the, the program I run, the Middle East Partnership Initiative, has been uh, coordinating our economic uh, support funds for the region uh, to make sure that the types of programs that we're act are running are actually working to promote the type of reform that we've been uh, seeking to achieve. And in 2002, the president in, uh, started something called the Middle East Partnership Initiative, which I run, which is to support primarily the non-governmental sector. Uh, and we are doing that uh, to the tune of about $300 million uh, over the last few years in terms of programs supporting civil society. In June of 2004, when the United States was in the presidency of the G8, uh, we launched at Sea Island something called the Broader Middle East and North Africa Initiative. The Broader Middle East and North Africa Initiative basically looked to take advantage of, of various programs that we were running, whether it was the European um, Barcelona process, Euromed, uh, the New Neighborhood Policy, um, the Middle East Partnership Initiative, and our other bilateral programs, um, the programs that the Japanese and Germans and others were doing in the region, and say, hey, look, why don't we bring all the governments together from the region? Why don't we also invite civil society for the first time to join this process and say, what can we do together um, uh, to address the uh, challenge of reform in the region. You know, the UN Human Development Report, the first one in 2002, uh, pointed out the, the great uh, deficits in the region, whether it was economic deficit, uh, political deficits, uh, the inability of women to be fully empowered, um, and the profound lack of um, education, modern education systems that could address uh, the needs of uh, the societies in the 21st century. You know, the World Bank calculates that some 100 million new jobs will need to be created in the Arab world as a region uh, within the next 15 years. Uh, and what we know about the non-oil GDP of the region is that it is the equivalent, if you take the whole region, it is the equivalent of Spain's. So clearly the challenges are great. And we recognize together with the Europeans uh, and the governments of the region, frankly, that by bringing the G8 into this uh, equation, we would be able to uh, have the be best hope of actually achieving uh, something there. And it's in that context that I'm going to Sana'a, by the way. One of the elements of the broader Middle East and North Africa initiative uh, is something called the Democracy Assistance Dialogue. And this is where um, non-governmental organizations make presentations to governments on various elements and aspects of political uh, reform. Uh, in addition to that, we together at last year's Forum for the Future launched a new foundation. Uh, and the board has finally uh, come together. And we'll be having uh, the first meeting of the board uh, shortly. Um, I think it's the successful work of the Democracy Assistance Dialogue, the establishment of the Foundation for the Future, the annual Forum for the Future meetings, other broader Middle East and North Africa activities, uh, combined with you know, the Barcelona process, the Euromed process, and other activities of Europeans. Um, it demonstrates that there is a desire for partnership. And, and that there is a desire and understanding that unless the, the problems of the region are addressed at home, and unless change comes at home, the problem of immigration will increase. And the, and the prospect of having um, an assimilation integration process uh, take place <clears throat> can take place without the, um, the overflow of um, massive 
numbers of economic uh, and other refugees in the region. Um, it also demonstrates that, that there is in the region a strong desire to see change. You know, in 2000, 2001, I remember talking, using the, the words um, reform and the Arab world were not uh, words that typically went together. There was a sense, a real strong sense, that um, it was uh, a place which was stagnating, but that was okay. Um, that was the way it was, and that's the way it would always be. Um, George Bush, called, when people started to call for uh, reform in the Arab world, and people were saying, no, um, Arabs are not ready for democracy, he said, we can't let ourselves be held hostage to the soft bigotry of low expectations. Why should this be the only part of the world um, that doesn't have the benefits of human freedom? Um, slowly, together, I think we and Europe have recognized that we need to do something um, more on this. Um, I was handed, right before I came into the building, the statement uh, that just came out of the USEU summit. It's the declaration. And there's a paragraph I'll just quickly read to you. Um, we, Europeans, US, will continue to support reform in the Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean region and the Middle East and will promote greater participation of civil society in the reform process through our respective efforts, including the Barcelona process, the European neighborhood policy, the Middle East partnership initiative, and our joint actions through the broader Middle East and North Africa initiative and the foundation and funds for the future. Um, we're in this together. Uh, we recognize that the challenges are, are that, that will confront um, Europe in these areas are going to be very uh, difficult. And the dynamics of effective integration uh, are most foremost in the minds of many communities, the sense of insecurity. We only need to point to events such as the London bombings and recent alleged plot to commit terrorist acts in Canada to know that challenges uh, remain. Even within the US, a lone Muslim Iranian immigrant who spent most of his life in the United States drove his car into a courtyard full of students at the University of North Carolina, claiming to take revenge for U.S. actions against Muslims worldwide. He was a recent UNC graduate, and in, in high school was a, the student council president and member of the National Honor Society. Uh, out in Detroit, I heard many complaints. Uh, as American Muslims are under scrutiny, not only from law enforcement agencies, but also from within their own community. No one wants their faith hijacked in the name of violence, and many major Muslim American organizations have repeatedly pledged cooperation with law enforcement and with organizations like the State Department. American experience of full integration, political, cultural, economic integration, and a sense of having a stake in the community, in the, in the future of the, uh, of the community, are at the core of the American experience. These are some of the best guarantees against individuals becoming disaffected. As I said, there are no guarantees. Um, but the system is important. How people participate, how they have access, um, whether they feel that they can be treated as equals. Um, you know, in, in societies that have uh, a degree of flexibility, um, I think, that they, and a way of, of having concrete ways of politically expressing uh, themselves, is that most people like to be governed from the center, left or right, or, but it's from the center, um, and that the extremes, the tails of the bell curve, are small. Um, and it's in societies where you can see uh, a huge uh, tail and a very thin center that you know that there's something wrong uh, inside the, the society. Um, the United States is committed and persistent in the cause of advancing freedom in the Middle East and North Africa. We're not backing away. We believe that democracy, greater openness, can bring peace, prosperity, and stability to the region, a fuller and more stable uh, stability and ensure its full participation and integration into the international community. 
It is also our commitment to full integration at home that allows our citizens to seek dialogue with their representatives rather than to engage in violent actions. We look forward to working uh, with many partners, uh, Europeans and others, uh, toward this collective goal. With that, I'll just stop and see if uh, we can take uh, some questions. Thank you very much. Defamation, a, a human right. Um, this proposal grows out from the cartoon controversy, but it obviously promises uh, to create a great deal of discord between the West and, and the Islamic countries because in the West they will be seen as um, an intervention against um, freedom of speech. Um, I know that people in the UN already are quite insidious about how to deal with this issue, and I was wondering how you saw it, if you thought there was any room for compromise on this or any ways of diffusing this potential conflict or the addition of, of uh, religious deformation as a human right. Um, well, I hate to admit it, but I'm not familiar with the specific OIC uh, decision to, to make this move. I think that um, in the discussions uh, that we and others have had with the, um, the leadership in the OIC, there has been this desire to not stoke the flames further and not to create uh, uh, a head-on um, kind of battle over these issues. And I hope that we could find a way to um, uh, talk about this without creating that type of, because I agree with you, it will be polarizing. Uh, and, and therefore not in anyone's interest. And so um, I'm not sure how far this has developed or expanded, but my, my supposition is that perhaps there are other interim steps that can be uh, worked on before getting to that particular point. I, uh, I is about the uh, MEPI program and similar programs. Uh, I, I'm, the, I'm the director of the Gulf Institute and uh, I see that there is a tendency uh, these programs, not only American but European programs, to be limited to very few countries, the Palestinian territories, Jordan and Egypt, uh, uh, where a small number of the population is. You don't see programs in Libya, Sudan, in the Gulf and other countries and that is partly because you have the uh, Levant immigrants uh, basically directing the funds, your funds, uh, only in their own countries or to their own people where uh, there are higher needs in areas like in the Gulf uh, and in, the, in, uh, in Africa for uh, similar programs in Yemen, for example. So is, are you attempting to sort of equalize uh, th those funds and distribution of these funds to countries that are in higher need, uh, like, especially with education in Yemen and Sudan and even in the Gulf, which is with women and children and so on? So I, I hope that is something uh, you sure. have in your... Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I need to correct a, a misperception. In fact, uh, the Middle East Partnership programs are available across uh, the Arab world, and where we focus are, uh, yes, there, it's true that in countries like Jordan, we have a lot of programs going on. Lebanon, we have a lot of programs going on. Uh, but f frankly, the focus really has been on trying to find ways uh, to support think tanks, uh, and uh, like the Gulf Research Center, we're doing some things with um, others in the Gulf especially on women's empowerment issues. And we have a l number of programs in Yemen specifically because of the, uh, the issues you raise. I mean, the, the challenges and the needs are greater there than elsewhere. Uh, but we have programs in, uh, I have to say, the Middle East Partnership Initiative doesn't cover the same ground as the Arab League geographically. So Sudan, for instance, falls out. Uh, 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 Djibouti is not in, Mauritania is not in. But, uh, from Morocco all the way across, we have um, many, many, many uh, programs, and we're open to new ideas all the time. We have, an, we have two office, regional offices. One is in Tunis for uh, kind of North Africa, um, and the other is in Dubai, and it, it, Abu Dhabi, excuse me. Um, and 
if, if you're interested or if there, you have ideas, uh, please get in touch because we really are looking to empower uh, organizations to do uh, things related to reform across the Gulf in particular. Because part of the problem in the Gulf for us has been there's so much money. So people say, well, why would the United States, why would the American taxpayer spend any money uh, in the Gulf? Well, because these governments aren't going to spend money on this kind of thing. <laughs> That's the answer. So we want to be able to um, help if we can. Um, I'm sorry. Hello, thank you for the lecture. Um, my name is Yunus. I'm from Yunus Tehem from the Embassy of Morocco. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is: Since the morning we've been talking about, and when we've been listening to you or to the other scholars talking about terrorism, but the only events we've been talking about is Madrid, London, and September 11th. Mm -hmm. Why? That's my question. Why don't we talk about it in a, a more global perspective. It happened in Casablanca, it happened in Beirut, it happened in Jeddah, in Saudi Arabia itself. Why are we treating it from a very limited um, space? That's, that's my question. Well, Thank I, you. I think, the, I think the answer to the question is pretty straightforward. Um, that, as I said, the, 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 the September 11th took us by surprise. Maybe it shouldn't have. But all of a sudden, we woke up to all these uh, challenges and problems where we didn't see them before. But, you know, and if I think about Morocco in particular, how responsive and quick was the international condemnation of the bombings in Casablanca and how our foreign policy, especially toward Morocco, moved quickly um, to make sure that uh, the Agency for International Development did not close in, in Morocco, which it was scheduled to do. Uh, where we have been working very closely with the government of Morocco on MCC and other issues as a recognition that these, and with Jordan, uh, which just suffered these horrendous bombings, uh, uh, and with the Saudis, in, 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 with the Saudis as well. But the question is, when you're asking the question, which I think is being asked here, how are uh, our societies, uh, American society and European societies, um, uh, uh, struggling with the concept of integration um, of Muslim communities, uh, that the question in, in part stems from the fact that if you don't look to uh, find ways to integrate people and have them feel that they have a stake, either in the United States or in Europe or in Egypt or in Morocco, then people are going to become frustrated to the point that they may resort to violence. So it is a global phenomenon. We recognize that, and we work with all the governments in the region on this issue. But at the same time, we need to get at some of these underlying um, challenges, which in Morocco, I think, you know, also stem from lack of economic opportunity. And so we're working with the government to try to do as much as we can to drive uh, the prospect of um, opening up. And the king has been a great reformer. So um, we are, as I say, working in partnership, but the question about why is it that the United States is pushing a, a new agenda of reform in the Arab world cannot be answered unless you talk about September 11th. Yeah. Just one thing, if I might, sir, just as a, a point of clarification on behalf of the Bill Wilson Center and our partner organizations, the reason we emphasize attacks in those cities during the first two panels and during the opening uh, keynote address is because those attacks, however much the sympathy from the United States or the Western world for attacks and the, the, for the victims of those attacks in that part of the world, they're not directly symptomatic of the issue that is at hand here, and that is Islam in Europe. So I just want to offer that distinction, and I'm not sure that it's fair to Mr. Carpenter to have to answer that question as to why the two panels this morning focus mostly on I included Istanbul, because to me that was the first direct hit on Europe, but then especially, of course, Madrid and London. So you've got Kartushma, CSIS Turkey project. Um, you talked about the Merhaba. Um, you talked about the importance of uh, encouraging democracy uh, in the Middle East and free elections, but obviously, as we saw in the uh, uh, last uh, Hamas example, elections do not always bring about desired results. How do you think the United States uh, should uh, reconcile such situations, balancing 
um, the encouragement of democracy and uh, peaceful um, governments. Again, um, let me say this. Um, we believe that greater political openness leads to greater stability, ultimately. And that if you're to avoid, especially in countries where there are very deep and very real divisions, sometimes where you don't have a benevolent dictator to rely on, um, democracy has to be the only way. I mean, if you look at Iraq right now, if you did not have a political process underway, if you didn't have those elections, if you didn't have the referendum, if you didn't have a political leadership that was willing to work through these issues, I think you'd be in a lot worse off position um, than, than you are right now. It may be hard to imagine, but I can guarantee it would be the case. I think that in West Bank, Gaza, had there not been elections in January, there would have been civil war. Um, now, we may be heading that way right now, but the fact is that the elections at least created the possibility of having a legitimate government on the Palestinian side that would able, be able to talk about the peace process with the Israelis and hopefully lead into a different direction in which we're heading. Right now, Hamas, though, elected. The president said, you know, look, this was a great election. We praised the Palestinian people. The Central Election Commission, the only independent Central Election Commission in the entire region, did a fantastic job. The, uh, the media covered the elections well, it was extraordinary, um, etc. But now the government has a policy that it, if it's going to be part of the international community, it has to change. It's different than being from, you know, from being in opposition. So it's no one's questioning the democratic results of the elections. No one. But as the international community, we're questioning our responsibility of, uh, of dealing with that government. And we've concluded as the international community that we're not going to deal with that government until it changes some of its fundamental uh, positions. Please. I'm sorry. Uh, well, since the, some sanctions again against the Hamas uh, administration are on the agenda and uh, seriously discussed not only in the United States but also in Europe, uh, how is it possible to convey the message to the people in the Middle East that democracy is actually, or free elections are respected and uh, part, you know, uh, encouraged? I think we have to differentiate, and maybe this is a lack of experience with the democratic process in the region, but you have, to dem you have to distinguish between process that elects a government, you know, and what the government's policies are. Um, because if, if, you know, we have elections coming up in this country uh, in, uh, in November, and there's a great deal of debate about what direction the country's headed in, whether, there's a, whether the United States is going through a period where people are going to be ready to really embrace wholesale change or whatnot. But policies matter and ideas matter. And no one took away or wanted to take away the Palestinian right to make a choice about who would govern them. But like all decisions, uh, when you make a decision, you have to live with the consequences of the decision. I do not think, and Abu Mazen clearly does not think, that the Palestinian people voted for continued uh, uh, war with Israel. They voted uh, for Hamas because they wanted to vote against a perceived corruption and inability to government, govern on the part of Fatah. Um, and so that's why I think Abu Mazen is looking at the poll saying, hey, this referendum idea looks pretty good to me. 75% of the Palestinian people want to uh, s say that we should be negotiating with the Israelis and recognizing their right to exist. And maybe this whole nightmare will go away on the other side. Um, so governments have to relate with governments. Um, that's my, my job. I, I would like to uh, relate with, um, as a member of the executive branch in the State Department with lots of different people. But when I have my first call, it has to be the foreign ministry. Um, and this is, the, this is the challenge of the international community. Hamas has a choice to make. I don't think, I don't think that Palestinians or anybody in the Arab world should take the wrong message from the elections in West Bank, Gaza. They can also look at the elections uh, in Iraq. We're prepared to work with people that we don't normally like. Um, but it's a matter of policy, not positions. And you look at around the world, we deal with governments all the time that we don't quote unquote like. Uh, and we deal with the will of, of the people. And governments, whether they like it or not, have to deal with us. 
uh, because we are also uh, a democracy. So the legitimacy of the choice is not in question. I'm Dr. Ali from London University. I want to ask a question. How does, um, how does uh, the Bush government see the relationship with Saudi Arabia in particular? Um, I was fortnight ago was in Atlanta and I delivered a speech regarding the destruction of the holy sites in the kingdom of Mecca and Medina. Uh, basically, what, the, uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, one of the good things that George Bush uh, uh, showed the world was expose the extremist movement, which is the Wahhabis. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, after 9-11, of course, a lot of people have been aware what the Wahhabi movement is and what has been, uh, it's been causing for the past 100 years or so. Uh, but recently, there have been some developments in Saudi Arabia where King Abdullah has been, uh, he's been addressing a lot of people, saying that the abolishment of the, uh, the Matawa, the religious clerics, which are the extremist uh, clerics who have been operating in, in the Hejaz for many years, uh, who have actually gripped hold of the, uh, the Saudi youth and, and preaching a lot of hatred against America and the West. Uh, how does uh, America see that? Um, I think it's an excellent question, and I think that we recognize that the export of um, uh, Wahhabism from Saudi Arabia is backed with the huge uh, wealth that the Saudis have has been a huge problem. It's and and you know, you know, I, I sometimes think about any idea that would be backed with hundreds of billions of dollars over a very long period of time uh, would probably have some equal success around the world. I mean, I think about Coca-Cola and McDonald's and, and whatever. I mean, we all recognize it from wherever we are. It's a, it's a brand. Um, but this idea is, is, um, is a challenge. And I have to say, and I know that there are people in the room that won't agree with me necessarily, but that King Abdullah has really sought to begin to uh, begin to address this seriously. Um, he's introduced the notion that all four schools of thought can be part of the judicial process. He has met with uh, Shia in, in the holy cities where there weren't supposed to be any. Um, he, has, um, he has, as you said, begun to look at the, uh, the Motawa and to, to begin to circumscribe uh, a bit what they're able to do. He, the policy of the Saudi government now is to stop the export of hate literature and to change the curriculum of uh, their textbooks. Now I've seen, uh, you know, and if you go to the embassy and you ask them the question uh, and see what they have to say on the issue, I think that they'll say, yes, that's right. We want to stop the export of this, um, of this literature that's causing uh, such problems. Interestingly, when I was last in Saudi Arabia, um, I was asked to go visit the, um, uh, this museum in Riyadh. And I thought, look, I'm only here for a day and a half. We've got a lot to do. Why do you want me to go to this museum? And they oh, no, you have to go, you have to go, you have to go. And I couldn't, you know, it's going to take an hour and a half going to go through the museum. Um, but then it occurred to me why. Um, you know, there were ancient artifacts in that museum from pre-Wahhabist uh, times. Um, there was in the museum the idea of the history of the, the kingdom, the notion that Saudi Arabia was something other than simply where the holy cities of Mecca and Medina were, that this represents a bit of a shift in the ideology of, of the kingdom in a way that recognizes that the seat, uh, the source of real instability is coming from within to the kingdom. So um, I don't know. They, they may have started too late. Uh, they could turn it off like this. Um, anything could happen. But I have to say that in the last, I'd say, year and a half, year or so, um, they've begun to take incremental steps, which I think are positive. I mean, we have to remember, you know, getting to, and the national dialogue and the discussion of the other, et cetera, I think all this is good things. But, you know, we're starting from a fairly low base. I mean, getting to tolerance would be, you know, you know, excellent. Um, so uh, we recognize fully that the source of a lot of the, uh, the, the extremist ideology is coming from 
there or has been exported from there. And so that, that is a, it's a challenge. Also, all of our oil, yours and mine. We received State Department guidance that you can answer one more question. OK. So if there's one more question, All right. Well, thank you all again very much. Um, I uh, really enjoyed the conversation. I hope we'll have another chance to do so. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this will conclude our luncheon program. Mr. Carpenter will have to depart. And we will ask all of you to assemble in the auditorium for the third and closing panel for today's conference. Thank you all very much.